Welcome everyone to Reorg's webinar on French care home operator OPEA's second conciliation this year. We'll um, wait for the audience to join and we'll get started in a few seconds. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Uh, we're here to take a closer look at the chain of events uh, that led to French care home operator Orpea to op um, open a second round of conciliation in, in a year in France. The company stuck a soft agreement with its lender in June uh, under its first conciliation, but this time around it looks to be coming back uh, with the prospect of a full-blown restructuring on the table. Um, we'll be looking today at the causes of all payers underperformance, um, how the group could exit conciliation, um, consider the company's balance sheet issues, and also um, see how it, you know, restructuring might address those. We will be recording this session, uh, so Reorg subscribers will be able to access the replay tomorrow. A copy of the slides will also be available. We welcome your questions, so please submit them um, at any time during the webinar using the Q&A button at uh, the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to get through as many questions as we can. We have already factored in some of the questions we got in advance of this recording um, in our presentation. So let's get started by introducing our panel today. I'm Julie Mieko, I'm Reworks Managing Editor in Europe. And I'm joined here by Giulia Rusconi, who is the head of the credit analyst team in EMEA, and Shan Qureshi, who is a legal director. Both of them are actively involved in our EMEA core products. Um, welcome to you both. Hello, thank you. Thanks, Julie. Pleasure to be here. The three of us are, are essentially members of Reorg's trifecta, which is the combination of uh, journalistic, legal and financial expertise to provide our subscribers with a holistic view of the credits we cover. To get us started, I'll take a look at the agenda for today, where we'll provide an overview of the company. Um, we'll highlight what triggered it um, to, to go into debt talks, first with the share price declining and the timeline of events um, that accelerated after the publication of a book called Les Fossoyeurs or The Grave Diggers by an, ind an independent journalist called Victor Castanet. We'll explain what the result of the first conciliation was. Um, we'll go through the detailed review of the company's balance sheets and we'll take you through some of the implication of the French law uh, protection um, under a new regime introduced in 2021. Um, this will help us set the scene um, as the company goes into this second round of restructuring, which she, the company did say would likely feature a debt equitization. So Orpea is one of France's two larger private care homes. Um, um, it's a listed company. It has 250,000 residents or patients under its care. And under the French regime, APAD, which are Establishment for Dependent and Elderly People, are financed through a mix of private and public funding. Um, the state and regional health agency pays for most of the workers' wages. Um, other local entities finance various supplies, while the family of the residents pay for the rent um, and the meals for those residents. Since 2017, care homes have benefited from more flexibilities over how they decide to allocate these fundings to suit their needs. Next slide, please. In January of this year, Victor Castanet released a book called Les Fossoyeurs. Um, this book was the result of three years of investigations. Uh, it featured the, the, the comments from 250 people that he interviewed, people who actually might have been relatives of um, people in the care of Orpea or staff from various level of the hierarchy. The book or the journalist also spoke to some public figures and some government representatives. Um, the witness accounts described practices that were akin to mistreatment and um, a clear decision to make sure that we, the company kept costs low at all costs. The ripple effect from the, the book led to a public inquest 
um, which was which took place in March. Um, and this inquest made some recommendation uh, on how the country should change some of the some of the processes by which it finances care homes in France. All this negative attention essentially hit the company's share price and it essentially put a lot of pressure on it uh, when it needed to refinance short-term loans. So in April, OPEA opened its first conciliation. Um, that's according to um, the judgment of the conciliation which was obtained when it was finally signed in June. Now I'll leave the floor to Julia to discuss uh, OPEA's financials and to review how OPEA ended up having to open a second conciliation. Thanks, Julie. So we move. In this slide, we have uh, provided a picture of uh, OPEA cash flow generation. I think it's important to highlight here that over the last five years, OPEA has significantly expanded beyond French borders. It's one of the biggest players in Europe and it has also expanded a lot in, in Latin America, uh, for example, in, in Brazil. So if we look at the cash flow from operation, which we attribute to the mere uh, management of the elderly care, cash flow generation was positive and net of interest paid as well. But once we start factoring to uh, lease payments and maintenance capex, we can see that um, cash really um, has starts to deteriorate. And the, the, um, the red lines uh, include also growth capex, so the investments that OPEA has um, done in real estate by either developing new facility itself or by acquiring other private operators or uh, other facilities. So this is what was really driven, has really driven the cash burn of the company over the past um, five years and a half. Going to the next slide. Um, we can see really how the real estate portfolio of Orpea has developed since 2011, actually, is the first, uh, the first chart. Um, Orpea says that um, um, their strategy is to hold only 50% of the facilities that they operate, 50% in the terms of the number of facilities, not in terms of value. And you can really see here how the ownership rate has developed. And the more they grow the real estate portfolio, they also uh, grow leverage, both on a post and pre first basis. And essentially the way this works is that they develop or they buy these new assets and then sell and lease back the portion they don't, don't want to own, but they, they essentially just keep on the balance sheet has um, leases. So really this, coupled with the cash burn can you know suggest that uh, Orpea is really reliant on external debt to fund capex and its uh, commitments and moving to the next slide we can see what happened essentially during the first conciliation so when these um, allegations uh, came out the investigation fundings uh, were came out to the public um, the group really found itself unable to tap the market, to refinance its debt maturities and to fund CapEx, also considering the, you know, the challenging primary market that featured 2022. Uh, Orpea said at the time that the CapEx committed for 2022 and 2023 was 900 million per year, which is significantly above what they spent uh, historically. Um, so they opened this conciliation procedure. We closed on June the 10th um, with the core banking group uh, agreeing to uh, provide a syndicated facility of 1.7 billion on a senior secure basis, which is the aggregate of the A1, A2, A3, A4 and B loans. They also set up a disposal plan, very ambitious one, uh, where they have essentially agreed to complete more than 3 billion worth of asset disposals by 2025, with 1 billion to be realized by the end of next year in 2023. And the proceeds from the sale were supposed to be allocated in priority for the repayment of this syndicated facility. Um, they also put in place another optional uh, syndicated facility, the C loans, up to 1.5 billion, which was open both to the uh, existing core banking group and new, uh, new creditors. And uh, what's interesting here, the C-loans is not covered by the privilege or condition. And the, particip the participants to the syndicated facility, 1.7 billion, that decide to participate into the optional facility would receive the first, um, first lien, um, first ranking pledge equal to the other, to the first facility. 
while for third-party creditors participating to the C loans, Orpea said it would uh, provide only a second ranking pledge in enforcement. One thing I could say, Julia, before you carry on, is that this arrangement was meant to help the company and provide it with a liquidity runway of about two years, um, um, excluding real estate assets. So this is interesting that they had to come back so early um, after the, the first deal was struck. Sorry. Carry yeah, on. no, absolutely. Do you have any more to add on this? Because you covered this with me super closely and we have done a lot of calls on this we a lot of brainstorming so anything uh, more you want to add on this and an additional regard? point maybe would be to say that obviously in terms of real estate assets this is a company that had a lot more than its peers so it was actually interesting and it would uh, it would have been you know interesting to see if you could have monetized that um, immediately obviously there's there are issues this year in the market outside of opea's control and maybe real estate's uh, valuations um, have, have changed rapidly or deteriorated. Um, but this was another interesting point. The, the, the extent of their real estate portfolio was larger than its peers. Um, and it did think that it would have two years of runway of liquidity with the previous transaction. So these are my yeah, two comments. That's correct. And then it's interesting if, so if we move to the next slide, uh, this is something that we have also um, wrote about in our analysis in our first initial analysis on Orpea, the subscribers you can find on our website, where we really put together a comparison with Corian, which is the other uh, major player in the market. It's a French company as well, with large operation elsewhere like Orpea. And if you can see from the first rows of this peer table, essentially Orpea has, as I said, this strategy to own only 50%, but Conan has um, a strategy to own only 25%. So the assets owned by Orpea, which uh, as of December, they amounted to about 8 billion, are materially more than, than Corian, whose asset base of properties own, it's about 3, point, uh, about 3 billion. So here is the picture of the situation of the three players, the three major players uh, in the last fiscal year. You can see the margins are between 24, 25%. They're quite consistent across the three peers. Uh, um, they all, the, all of the three generate negative cash flow, but because they, as I said, they have this strategy to invest in real estate capex. And the picture changes if we look at the uh, first semester of uh, this year, 2022. So in the next slide, you can see the two players uh, at a glance. This is just the first semester results. And here we have a, a material drop in EBITDA margin for OPEA to 18.6% from previous 25% of last year. While it seems like Korea managed to hold their, their margins at about 24%. So still a decrease, but to a, a much um, a lower extent. And in the next slide, we have provided a picture um, of what management said about this drop. Uh, so they, they have provided a bridge from uh, the EBITDA margin reported in the same period last year versus the reported one this year. Essentially, the impact was from three different factors. One was the, the, the margin last year was benefit from um, sizable one of income, like reversal of provisions. Uh, another portion was due to uh, the reduction in COVID compensation, which was a sort of subsidies for, um, from the government to compensate for the compensation rate drop and the, the more cost that, that they have to uh, incur due to COVID. And management said that this year the occupancy rate, is, is the, it has recovered, but not to an extent that it could offset completely the COVID cost. And then the, the other major part is due to food inflation and energy prices. So Pia says that they don't hedge uh, energy prices, or at least this was the decision taken last year. And, um, and so because of this, uh, management said it would expect inflation to have to further deteriorate the margins in the next, um, in the next semester, leading to potential breach of confidence. And um, this alongside to the you know, weak economic uh, environment and uh, potential lower, uh, weaker outlook for the real estate market said that, you know, put the tone that this could jeopardize the disposal program and so liquidity. And that's why we came to the second uh, conciliation talk. So I'll leave the floor now to Shan to run us through conciliation and the French restructuring regime. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll take over from here. So um, I think when we talk about the French restructuring regime, 
the thing to remember is historically, the French restructuring regime has always been perceived uh, as a debtor-friendly system. I'm sure a lot of investors will be wary under the previous position where we had the existing safeguard proceedings whereby if an agreement wasn't made between creditors and the debtors, your bondholders could find themselves termed out for 10 years if no agreement was reached. And that's what happened on, I think, Comexposium last year. Further, the position was that your dissenting minority creditors could only be crammed down in a pre-pack financial safeguards. And even with that, there was no crammed down mechanism to get around the veto rights that shareholders had. There was no cross class crammed down uh, mechanism. And that's even if the shareholders were after the money. But fortunately, the position has changed. Uh, as Julie touched upon earlier, the French legislation has incorporated the European Parliament Directive on Preventive Restructuring Frameworks. And what that means in practice is we have a regime which favours creditors' rights more, and certainly from our point of view, has been active in enabling lenders to take control of debtors from, uh, from existing uh, shareholders. So the legislation I'm referring to is the uh, 2021 ordinance for those who uh, wish to look at that. Um, I think I need my next slide. So we, we have these, we have the conciliation, and this is what um, uh, Orpia has entered into. And I think Orpia will be a fantastic test of the new French framework. And for us to understand what this could look like for Orpia, let's have a look at the two tools we've got. So we've got the conciliation and the accelerated safeguard. And let's have a look. I'm going to use the anglicized accelerated safeguard because I keep murdering the French pronunciation so excuse me so let's uh, let's look at how they interact so the thing I want you to do is to hold in your mind that what the French legislation has done is essentially created a bridge between on one hand your court assisted consensual proceedings and then on the other hand your later insolvency proceedings now the idea here or at least the theory is that your restructuring solutions you negotiated uh, you negotiate those during the assisted amicable phase and then if those agreements cannot be consensually agreed, they are later implemented using a subsequently insolvency, a subsequent insolvency proceeding, which will bind. So, for Pierre's first uh, conciliation, you know, unanimous consent was um, uh, was achieved, uh, and therefore they didn't need to go any further. Here, though, we might have uh, a different issue as we come to the second conciliation. So, let's dive a little deeper, as my slides show, onto the conciliation, the amicable proceedings. Now, those who have come across conciliation before and seen Opia's first conciliation, you know that this is essentially a very confidential and flexible framework. We know it's confidential because the only thing we get is the judgment at the end, which isn't particularly detailed, uh, and the announcement that the company's gone into conciliation. That's probably a bit of a hangover from the French sort of uh, mentality on, on restructuring. Um, so this flexible regime is, uh, allows the conciliator, uh, the debtor and its shareholders, to work on restructuring solutions, importantly, without destabilizing the business. So this is a pre-insolvency procedure, remember, uh, available to either uh, a company which is facing, as um, it is, financial difficulty. And there's a ca caveat to this that the company has not been insolvent for more than 45 days, which, which uh, so far isn't, isn't relevant for Orpea. Now, what's the role of the conciliator? Well, the role of the conciliator is to help the company and its stakeholders to reach an amicable agreement to resolve the difficulties it's facing. Uh, and the current appointed conciliator, I believe, is uh, Ms. Uh, Bourgolo, who I think is uh, very, very, very famous and well known in, in, in the French restructuring industry. Now, here's the important part to remember it's consensual in nature. All of your parties have to agree in order for the agreement to be binding. There's no cram down power or there's no cross class, cross, cross -class cram down power. So the other thing to remember is a debtor can enter into and close numerous conciliations. There's no limit in theory. And the initial term of your conciliator must be within a four month, uh, must be within a four month limit, which can be extended uh, once. So to summarize that, this, this conciliation proceeding is, is essentially a, a privileged place to negotiate restructuring proceedings. As I said, they remain confidential until agreement is reached. And then that agreement can either be sanctioned homologated by the court and the, and the judgment becomes uh, public, as we saw back in June, or the court can just acknowledge it and it, and it remains private. But, but there's, there's certain advantages, which are probably beyond the depth of this webinar, of, of having court sanction, which essentially it, it protects your, your creditors and then stops you know, clawback and other things. So 
that's a very idealistic uh, view of what a conciliation can be. But look, we all know, us restructuring lawyers and practitioners, that you've got a diversity of creditors in any restructuring and so many opposing interests that they maybe make, make it very difficult to reach an amicable, am, am, amicable agreement. So remember, conciliation is just consensual. One thing to add that I would add in this specific context, Sean, is that the company did say that there was going to be some equitization of debt. So it makes it very likely that it will need to implement that um, if anything comes to it uh, in, in, a, in a different regime. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Could I have my uh, next slide, uh, please? So this is the second part. So this is the, the second destination of the restructuring regime. We've got the, the bridge. We have our conciliation. And now we're at the point where okay we've got an agreement but it cannot be uh, you know unanimously agreed what do we do well then this is the next step you go to the uh, accelerated safeguard and certainly from my point of view this is where things get interesting so the conciliation does not have the power to bind non-consenting uh, creditors once you've got your conciliation you can then open accelerated safeguard or financial accelerated safeguard Regards. The important thing here is now you have the power to bind your consented creditors, but you must remember that you need to go to conciliation first. Um, and I think that's what we've seen in some of the, uh, the announcements, uh, you know, um, uh, presented by OPEA. They state that, you know, this conciliation is, is a first step and they don't say we're going to do an accelerated safeguard, but it looks like that may be a possible step if, if they want to implement it. So let's talk a little bit more about this, uh, this safeguard. So the tool allows the debtor to adopt a plan even when certain classes of creditors have opposed it through cross-class ground down subject to an absolute priority rule. Um, the, sort of, the rules are aligned at uh, allowing the plan to be adopted by aligning the political powers that creditors have within their economic situation and also limiting the harmful power uh, of creditors who are uh, out of the money. Now remember, as I mentioned earlier, the court, the French court can no longer force a term out upon creditors if the classes reject the proposed plan. And that was the last position. So there's no fallback position for a pair if the plan is rejected. Now, this important change probably makes, in certainly my view, this a more creditor-friendly regime because the debtor can't sit back and say, well, if you guys don't reach an agreement, you'll get turned out. No, what happens is you just exit safeguard and you were where you were before. So let's look at this accelerated safeguard process uh, as if it were an exit for OPEA. So we know that you can't enter your accelerated safeguard unless you've had a consensual proceedings beforehand. OPEA has done that. Um, and we know that uh, you must uh, have a, a draft plan to ensure uh, the, the viability of, of your plan, which must be presented in conciliation, and your company must not have been insolvent for more than 45 days. And I think OPEA is certainly getting towards that position. Um, the only the affected uh, parties are entitled to vote on the draft plan, uh, which means that maybe creditors who are directly impaired by the proposed plan will, will vote, and similarly equity holders who are having their equity interest uh, amended can vote. Finally, and I'll sort of maybe in my la last part of, of my slides, I'll, I'll draw some, simulate, uh, some, some similarities uh, between the accelerated safeguards and the French 26A. Um, you have court hearings, you have cross class cram down, and it's binding on all creditors. Um, I will say I think uh, I think I missed the slides. We go back. So let's let's um, perhaps uh, okay. Let's go a little bit more into uh, the, the 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 accelerated safeguard. So and as I said, I'll try and compare this to the restructuring plan. So the first thing to remember is credit credit committees. They used to be uh, used by uh, uh, previous French tools. They're gone. The uh, accelerated safeguard actually uses creditor classes coupled with cross class cram down. Now. It's the French appointed, uh, French court appointed receiver who will determine class constitution based on, and this is interesting, based on tenants that the creditors share a sufficient community of interests will be in the same class, and that creditors in the same class should benefit from equal treatment by the plan. Now, that's quite a departure from what we have in the UK. Um, when you're looking at schemes of arrangement and 26A, we've got well, decades of, of jurisprudence under, under schemes and certainly two two or three years under the 26A, but your classes are, with the basic tests, are creditors who have the same rights against the debtor should be placed in the same class. Nothing to do with interests. So 
this sort of community of interest concept means that, you know, obviously OPA is using a French uh, uh, proceeding, but you might have a slightly different outcome had it used a scheme or a restructuring plan. Um, in terms of our, our numbers, we are requiring two thirds of creditors in each class uh, for, for each class to, to consent. So that's your in-class cram down number, your uh, two thirds. Uh, that's lower than the English tool, 75%. Uh, and then we also have cross-class cram down. And we've had a few um, questions before about cross-class cram down. So let's try and in a nutshell explain how, how it works in France. So the key conditions, and I'm only going to set out the, the jurisprudence ones rather than the, the sort of ad administration um, requirements, because let's just assume the all payer uh, you, uh, follows all the correct administrative points. So in order for cross-class cram down to be used in accelerated safeguards, uh, it needs to be uh, there needs to be an approval by a majority of the in the money classes, including secured for higher ranking claims. Secondly, there needs to be uh, a compliance with the absolute priority rule. Uh, essentially, that means you can't give any junior class uh, any cash until you've fully repaid anyone who above, who's above them. Uh, and finally, a compliance with uh, the rule according to which a creditor cannot receive more than their entitlement. Now, this cross-class cram down can be used to bind equity holders uh, to the plan if the equity holders are out of the money and there's no transfer of all or part of the rights of equity holders. So there's a small sort of residual shareholder right there. And we have to remember in, in, in the um, case of Orpair, it, it's listed, so it's a very different shareholders than I make to uh, other French um, restructurings we've, we've covered. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is court involvement and challenge, right? Because this is when things get uh, complicated for our debtor. So broadly speaking, the, the way that, or, or, or the things that can be challenged by creditors uh, if they're not happy, are uh, class um, class formation, which is, is similarly something that which is often challenged in, in schemes in 26 age. You know, people arguing they should be fracturing all the classes, or they're not in the in the, in the right class. Uh, if that's going to be uh, 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 pursued, then any sort of dissenting creditor creditor will have to make its appeal uh, immediately after they have been notified about the formation of their classes. Uh, and then finally, in terms of practical terms. Once your draft, your draft plan has been adopted by each of your classes, it's submitted to the relevant French uh, commercial courts, uh, and then it's up to the courts to decide whether or not it gives a, a positive judgment. So that's my uh, uh, sort of French restructuring regime run through. Thank you, Sean. That's very helpful. Um, one thing maybe we could touch on is the privilege of conciliation, of new money in conciliation, uh, and how some of it applies here, perhaps. It's not a good time to Yeah, exactly. On. That's exactly right. Um, the, the 21 ordinance introduced uh, a sort of post-petition privilege. Uh, and, and in a nutshell, that means that any money provided subject to certain um, uh, qualities to the debtor during an accelerated safeguard, is going to be protected from antecedent claims or, or, or clawback transaction, i.e. if the company later in, uh, in, in, within a period of time enters into a hard insolvency, those creditors who've you know, stumped up cash uh, in, 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 into, into the company will have their um, super senior or, or senior uh, priority protected. So there's sort of a, it's called the post-petition uh, privilege, which is a um, fantastic thing for, for to have been put into the 2021 ordinance. Thank you. Uh, Julia. Yeah, so if we go to the next slide, here we have run a very quick exercise to see what could be um, the cash generation of our payout over the next uh, four years, assuming that there is no asset disposal besides what they has been already signed for this year. And assuming also that they do not incur any growth capex after 2023. So at the moment we said the management also said in the last earnings call that there is no room to reduce the growth capex committed for 2022. So we're assuming 900 million is gonna uh, come out of the cash outflows. So instead of for 2023, there could be some headroom to reduce it. So we assume at 700 million more or less. And then for 2024 and 2025, we're assuming just maintenance capex. And uh, this uh, forecast reflects the current financing arrangements. So we, it assumes that the A and B loans are fully drawn down by December, 2022, but only a portion of the C loans uh, is raised. This is because the second portion, uh, according to manager, is not yet committed, committed. And the slides also show that they say, or says that they would propose the second portion of the C loans to 
uh, be provided to will be proposed to other external creditors, but again, it's not committed. And then we are assuming a drop, a further drop in a beta margin in the second half of the year to conclude the year with the um, a fiscal year beta margin of 17.5%, so below the current, uh, the latest uh, results in, to, in uh, the first half of the year. And then you can see from the top, the bottom row, uh, there really there is a, a major cash uh, burn in 2022. Slightly recovering, but this coupled with the substantial maturities that uh, Orpea faces in 2023 would most likely lead to a liquidity shortfall if there is no asset sales. Um, so, if we go to the next slide, uh, we run here as well a very quick exercise to see how a recovery evaluation will look like. Um, again, the capital structure assumes the current financing arrangements. Uh, it, um, it, it captures the debt position that we expect uh, uh, Orpea will feature at the end of the year. Uh, so with the, the remaining A and B loans fully draw down and um, whose proceeds will be used also to repay some of the unsecured debt. Uh, so if you strip out the revolving credit facility here that we assume Orpea will need to draw to to support some of the cash burn, the aggregate amount of all the other unsecured debt is really, um, it, it equals 4.3 billion, which is the amount of debt that um, Orpea is proposing to equitize. And, and just as a, as a note, so this valuation, it uh, covers only the value of the operating business. It does not give consideration to the value of the real estate assets that has of June, um, equaled uh, 8.5 billion. This is because monetizing real estate would result in somehow uh, potentially more cash burn. This is because if you send and it's back all the assets that you intend to sell, then you have you know, uh, more leverage in terms of leases and a, a higher cash burn in terms of uh, lease payments. So really to conclude, I think we can, you know, in the next slide we have summarized really what's the situation um, at present and the challenges that Orpea uh, is facing. Um, so based on the recovery that I showed before with uh, unsecured net not fully recover, not having fully recovery, but only 33%, we really think of Orpea can avoid, um, can, uh, would need to debt to equitize um, a portion, if not all, the unsecured debt that it has on its capital structure. And this is also to reduce leverage, but also to clean the capital structure to attract new money to cover the uh, liquidity shortfall, either in, in form of debt or, or new equity. Um, we estimate that if you equitize all of the 4. billion unsecured debt, uh, this would only save or pay out 45 million of cash interest per year in 2023, 2024, and 2025. This is because the new uh, arrangement, the new financing raised during the first conciliation bears a much higher interest rate than the legacy debt, um, which Arpea said in it, it had an average cost of debt of about 2%. So there is a lot of things that needs to be fixed, uh, let's say, in this new transformational plan. Uh, it needs to recover profitability. Uh, there is a very little room to do more um, leases and sale and lease back. So we, there will need to be a trade-off between you know, just selling and scaling back operations or sale and lease back, but at the same time, adding more leverage on a post-surface basis and more um, and deteriorating cash even more because of the lease payments. It would need to extend the maturity of the, um, of the new financing that they just raised in conciliation and at the same time also reduce CapEx and sell assets and try to really restore its, its reputation and um, to provide you know, a better staff, more qualified, and really try to, to, to address some of the allegations that were raised uh, over the year. The, the difficulty, thank you, Julia, the difficulty, for instance, with this one in particular, with uh, hiring better trained staff is also that, you know, it kind of eats into your margins again. Mm -hmm. So it just feels like the, the, the OPEA has a difficult um, situation to, to address. Um, I mean, debt equitization is more likely. New money is also is, uh, something that the company seems to have asked. So it, it seems like all of the options that the company has listed as options are actually more required mm. than they are options <laughs> or will be necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, Shan? Yeah, I've seen a few, quite a few questions have come in. I think it's probably 
good time to us to tackle some of the Q&A and we'll be on for the next couple of minutes. So if anyone has any more questions, please, please do submit them and we'll do our best. So um, a lot of the questions are, or an example is, if there's no secured debt, can you have your unsecured creditors cram down convertible holders with voted equity? So I think one of the first points to note is we've not seen an accelerated safeguard um, of this scale before. So don't really have many precedents to work from. But if we look at what we know about the, the, the legislation, we know that there's creditor classes uh, and we know that our classes are, 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 are separated as their community of interest. So in the question, there's no reason why you couldn't have one group of unsecured uh, creditors and another group of convertible holders who are, as you say, uh, you know, seen as equity. Applying the rules, I said, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that there's, so long as you jump through the hoops, you know, respect your absolute priority rule, uh, 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 make sure that one senior um, class votes in favour, then I think the, the cross class cram down, it, it should work. Um, that's certainly how it appears to me that the legislation is drafted, but I haven't seen any, uh, you know, in practice uh, precedent. So short answer to that is, I think the legislation allows it, and I think um, I, I think we can we we might see cross class cram down. Um, the second question, or sort of area of question, we have is on the um, sort of new money privilege, uh, and I think this sort of well, the question I've been asked or we've been asked is how do you rank new money conciliation privilege here on the second privilege, given that we've already ha had a first one in June. Um, so that's an interesting question, and I don't know the exact answer. But the way I would approach it is. You, if, if, if a couple of French company can do numerous conciliation, I, I don't think you can be hindered in your second conciliation as to the rights you have. And what I mean by that is, if you are, you know, have the development, the 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 um the benefit of new money privilege in your first conciliation, I don't think there's any reason why you shouldn't be given new money privilege if you're new, new money privilege if you're a, a, a lender in your second conciliation. And I'm looking at sort of English law precedent here and. You have companies doing, you know, more than one scheme. We had Kadera do <laughs> two schemes recently, and you know, DTEC, for example, had had several, several schemes. And you're not prevented by your previous scheme from from doing some, something new. So, in answer to your question, I think I think there would be a new conciliation privilege here. And as as Julia alluded to, the, some of the new debt that's got in is, is going to have have its maturity extended because it it, it comes to, to maturity soon. So. I but think there's also all, maybe you know the, the new money that would be provided might come from parties you know like the unsecured creditors we have reported that they they are starting to organize um to organize yeah. they might just want to defend their state by providing some of that new money the company is asking for um and at this point you know you you probably find a way to square the equation with a new asset disposal program this new money coming in can be covered by some of that over time you put you know maybe a sort of a new waterfall in place you know there are ways around what the law provides i'm sure you know commercially yeah. there's going to be a number of negotiations and that this conciliation that could envisage a number of scenarios yeah. that make it work so that That's the right. providers of the new money uh, in conciliation one or two uh, might be covered that's right. I think, and I think the point you alluded to is bang on. It, it's a commercial, it's a commercial question rather than legal one as to whether or not groups of unsecured lenders feel like they want to put up new money. Um, we've had a few I, I'm, questions. I'm... Mm -hmm. um, well, another, this is a good question. You know, why did the banks not go down this option or, or not waiving covenants and taking out the subs during the first conciliation? Why now? Again, this is a commercial question. I think the way we saw it was the first, uh, the first conciliation. It was to give the company some breathing room to give some space whilst you know the second conciliation com has come in and certainly from the messages we're seeing from the company it does look like this is going to be a much much bigger restructuring what's what's your view on that one judy i was going to add actually the yeah you're, you're absolutely right with the breathing space from the first conciliation there was a number of for those of you who have seen on our website the conciliation ruling um it was very clear that a number of banks and some regional branches of banks were involved and, and Opea probably needed to rationalize its debt and make sure that it didn't have almost like a commercial paper type of pace to honor and to refinance small loans every mm. every other day, week, month. Um, so we put in place those big loans and it gave itself some space to breathe. Um, where I sympathize with the person asking this question is that certainly the environment wasn't much better in June than it is now for uh, real estate asset disposal, but the, the general consensus or the, the impression I got uh, from various conversations after the first deal was that 
because Opea does have such a great um, portfolio of real estate assets, there was trust in the fact that they could be sold and there would be clients and people or buyers, people interested in actually uh, monetizing those assets and therefore providing a bit of liquidity along the way. Um, so that's, that's definitely one angle that I think um, should not be, be forgotten about. The other thing is that um, uh, when you are under uh, scrutiny like that as a, as a French company and having so many things to fix, you probably also don't want to be kind of running a, a very aggressive restructuring where, yeah, possibly you might um, end up having to equitize a ton of uh, a ton of debt. So, but that's that's more speculation than, than fact. But the the <laughs> other point um, that someone is making in those questions is that maybe the French government might not be keen to see hedge funds in the equity. I mean, that's fair, but I would actually say that there have been a number of instances in France where companies have been taken over by creditors uh, who were hedge funds. Some of these companies weren't listed to begin with, so fair enough, here it's a listed company, but I wouldn't say that it's never happened before. Um, I wouldn't exclude it. As I say, it's perhaps not the norm, uh, but but it's not to be excluded. And I think the funds, uh, the, the investors that um, seem to be in the unsecured debt, you know, some of them might just be um, real money accounts. You know, it's uh, they've bought into the debt, but they may not all be hedge funds. So. Um, I would also I would also add that, and they may not take the equity. By the way, that's the other thing. They might bring the new money, um, and 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 who knows if they if they will take some equity. Who knows? It might be warrants as well. I, again, there's a number of scenarios. We we don't know what the equitization scenario will actually look like. Thanks, Julie. Julie, do you want to touch a little bit on 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 what Julie raised there regarding the asset disposal program? How how successful has, has the group been so far? So the, so far, they just actually signed a deal in July that is closed in September. So they didn't really provide any more disclosure on what other you know bids they have received or what specific assets they're going to sell. And I mean, essentially, what they said during the the earnings call is that this is being delayed, um, and this is really jeopardizing the whole uh, asset disposal program and the the repayment of debt that they had envisioned. If we look back also. Um, this issue of delay of disposal problem was raised even during the first uh, conciliation. So we, we published an analysis on our website where we, we have, you know, essentially disclosed uh, some of the asset sales they have done in the past over the last five years. And the only two material one was one in 2020 and one in 2021 for about 250 million. So that's clearly much less than, you know, the capex that they actually spent over the last five years. So I think this was, you know, one of the, the the questions that we had, and you know, raised some eyebrows when they actually then came out with such an ambitious plan. Mm -hmm. um, but again, in you know, the the you know, I think the argument is that there is a need for these care homes. Uh, um, so the demand is very strong. Uh, there is support in general from different players, different stakeholders. So it shouldn't be an issue for. Um, for PA to dispose of this, especially because they don't have a need to hold all of these assets on their balance sheet. They could just play like uh, Korean and just lease them. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's uh, it's not clear how this is going to develop or, and um, yeah, it's an open question mark. Well, you, you, you mentioned Korean. We've had another interesting question come in, which is there's, there's differences between the probability of various uh, geographies. What's your comment? on the outlook and you know, the follow-up part is if looking at Korean margins are holding okay -ish. shouldn't Korea, uh, Korean or, 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 Pia, or Pia reveal very similar margins in the long term? Yeah so when uh, so when we attended the call and you know by looking at the financials of Korean it seems that they manage inflation better. They don't specifically said why, if they hedge, for example, energy prices, or they did say they actually, they hire some better and qualified staff. Um, but, and on the other hand, uh, for Orpea, surely the 2021 um, financial was probably inflated by a lot of one-off, like this reversal provision. So it's unclear whether Korean uh, would see such a drop as well. I think in general, what we can expect for the sector, uh, given the, you know, the allegation, the, the very high 
scrutiny and the need for transparency, I would expect short to medium term to see all of the players in the industry being impacted, uh, not only for inflation, but really because they need to hire better staff, provide a better remuneration, um, provide a, num a higher number of uh, nursing staff for the number of residents. So medium term, I would say, you know, we can't really expect to all the players to hold on Hold, hold the 25% emitter margin, there could be you know, some decrease uh, and then a level up in the long term. Uh, but yes, I, there's no clear answer on, on why is current holding on and why Europe has been you know, so much um, impacted. What is sure, and Julie, please chip in, is that it seems that this whole allegation, so when we, we look at these two players at the very beginning, when we look at the findings and we read the 500 pages of the, the hearings of Orpea and Korean, it seems that Korean managed the crisis much better from uh, really, from addressing some issue more in a more transparent way and being much more proactive on some allegation, um, providing more evidence. So it seems that although, it, May, it may not be just an issue of Orpea, but it could have been like a widespread issue. It seems that Orpea was under so much scrutiny and the other players just simply managed the, the crisis better or they simply didn't mm -hmm. have the same extent of the, the issue. To a point, and I don't know that it's the answer to everything, but to a point, yeah, Korean CEO was very proactive, very visible, trying to actually manage the crisis um, and, and and from the report that was presented to the National Assembly in France it was essentially a lot of negative comments on some, on some of the directors and the management so everything that came out from even conversations with manage, management uh, into the public channels we're not talking about a book by a journalist we're talking about you know a, a social committee group doing a report in in this company that also said on a public document that you can still check today um, that they were a bit deflated with the answers that they obtained from OPEA. so i think they have actually well you know they might be facing similar situations as, as others in in the industry they probably haven't uh, been able to manage that wave um as professionally or as convincingly for the public in a way and i don't think that public image is the only thing i'm, I'm sure there's plenty of other factors here but but that one certainly came out um, when we did our uh, research into why their image was so much more damaged another reason why korean probably have performed better could be also driven by occupancy rate um, so Europea does not disclose the occupancy rate by region. Uh, it just says, you know, it's recovering from COVID, but surely the recovery was not enough to compensate some of the cost related to COVID. Uh, while Korean, on the other hand, they do disclose some of the occupancy rate. Uh, this seems to be at 90% on average, apart from some countries where they were still below 90. Uh, so that could be another reason. And we know in France, especially when this allegation came out, there was there had been a drop in occupancy rate for about two months. Then it leveled up in May and there was a, a slight increase in June. So surely it, the moment you, you, know, you start getting your, the resident walk out and you have all these fixed costs, then your margin are, are eroded necessarily. Thank you. Um, trying to go through some of the question. Yeah, there's one I can take, um, which is what priority uh, could government claims, which is a good question actually, what priority could governmental claims have compared to financial debt claims during accelerated safeguard proceedings? Could governmental entities hold up the process by asserting large claims related to OPS conduct? It's a great question, and the short is I, I don't I don't know the answer to it. Uh, I think it's certainly something we should think about. If we think about how um, it would depend on the type of claim. If it was a financial claim, it would depend what quarter comes from or in in France. Uh, if that if that claim has as an attachment, whether it's uh, dealt as as a claim as a you know a, a fine from a, from a, 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 a regulatory body rather than some sort of litigious claim, um, I think these are all sort of questions that all uh, are having having to deal with. Um, I haven't seen. Mm. I don't know if you have Julia or, or, or Julie any governmental claims yet. Um, no, I think Julia and I, in the course of writing on the company, when the first. Uh, when well 
when the first conciliation was still on effectively, we were thinking about maybe the possibility of government aids, you know, being clawed back. Um, that was something we, we had looked at. I don't know that anything like that has been suggested. You know, there was no mention of that really in the suggestions and recommendations. So I don't know that any of this would happen, for instance. That but also looks bad, doesn't it? That, yeah, that one, because at the end of the day, what you hit, you know, the person, the people you hit are the, are the people in the care homes, right. obviously. So that's that's difficult for, for a government to do that. So outside of that, I don't really know how the government could delay or, or make any other any other claims. The, the clawback was the only thing I had, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Juliana had discussed and we, we couldn't find evidence that this was the direction of the wind, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's correct. Um, so, so, it's, so in this instance, of course, like with most cases in France, um, there, there will likely be government involvement, but uh, but I don't think it will be in a way to delay uh, the conclusion of a restructuring. Um, as as we've actually again started to report, if mm. if unsecured creditors organize, if they have the ability to bring new money, if there is an ability to work out a, a, an adequate waterfall analysis, you know, waterfall not analysis, waterfall. Um, structure for this company it, it could uh, yeah could just come out of restructuring before the year is over and um and and have a more manageable capital structure mm -hmm. yeah we've, we've got some more questions there's a few on 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 how certain of our, our numbers have been reached out i think we can just reach out individually to, to, to those people regarding AV, EBITDA, multiple um, yes, yeah, so, and then also on our website, we publish the capital structure, so you would have the all the debt tranches uh, by priority and ranking and the leverage ratio as well. Um, one, one thing maybe to, to flag, I, I'm not sure if, if that will be true for everyone, but along our conversations this year for this credit, Julia and I often came across people who said, you know, I can't reconcile this capital structure. How do you find this loan? Where is that other loan? And, and it feels like maybe what the first conciliation helped with is streamline the cap stack and make it a little bit easier to read a little bit. Um, there are still questions about that C loan. <laughs> Where is it at nowadays and all the rest of it? But but it feels a little bit less scattered into private placement, should shine, bilateral loan here and there. Um, and, and it feels slightly simplified. Yes, and I would say that, you know, indeed, we it took a long time to have the full picture of the capital structure. Uh, we've got also a lot of questions on whether there is an organizational structure to see, you know, what debt is sitting, sitting at what level at all costs, whole costs, but that's not something that um, it's available. Uh, so we managed to get some uh, confirmation from IR. Um, and then for sure the, the, the disclosures during the second, the first conciliation procedure really helped to, to understand better um, the, the, the different debt tranches, the security, et cetera. Well, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Sean, for this conversation today. I hope it was helpful and I'm sure it's timely. Um, we're going to wind down the session because we are running out of time. But before we go, uh, a few closing comments. Um, for those of you less familiar with Rio, we are a global provider of credit data, uh, analytics and intelligence uh, for law firms, investors and advisors. Um, if you have any question, please email at customersuccess at rio.com. And remember that a replay will be available on Rio for Rio customers on the webinar and podcast uh, page within the next two days. Thank you all of us for joining today. And thanks again to Julia and Sean for a very interesting uh, and well-informed conversation. Um, thanks and have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks to you, Julia, as well. Bye.